to welcome you to the historic Somerville. And my name is Eileen Schofield, I'm the new president. And I would like to introduce you to Chris Wisniewski, who's going to do our lecture today. Chris is a personal historian and a founder of the business called Saving Stories, where she works with families, businesses, and organizations to preserve their history. She has worked extensively with families throughout New England and is currently conducting her work from London, England, for the next two years. So please welcome me. Help me welcome Chris. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd like to thank the Somerville Historical Society for inviting me here today. Um, as Eileen said, um, my name's Chris Wisniewski, and um, I have been working as a personal historian for about the past 10 years. Um, my business is called Saving Stories, and what I do is I help families and businesses and nonprofits preserve their history and stories. I take personal photographs and I turn them into books. Um, and I am uh, still working on projects here in Old England. Um, I'm sorry, in New England, but I'm also working on projects in uh, Old England as well. Today I'm going to be talking to you about one of the projects that um, I did for a family, for the, um, the family of Charles Williams Jr. of Somerville. And they um, hired me to do a book on one of their ancestors who they knew very little about, but knew that he had some connection to the early days of the telephone. Um, and so I produced this along with another personal historian named Stephanie Nichols. And we spent two years researching the story of the family, interviewing more than 20 people in the family who had all little bits of information, and did a lot of extensive research and came up with this book that tells the whole story of him. So that's what I'm going to share with you today. Um, so almost everybody knows the names Alexander Graham Bell and Thomas Watson, connected with the early days of the telephone. But without Charles Williams Jr., uh, Bell and Watson probably wouldn't have achieved the success that they did with their ideas. On April 4th, 1877, the Boston Evening Transcript included a short note in a column titled Brieflets. And it was a very tiny little note that they included in there, but it would have a profound impact on society for decades to come. The paper stated, the first telephone line ever established has just been constructed between the office of Charles Williams, electrician in this city, and his house in Somerville. The importance of this news was given equal weight with a man falling down on Hanover Street and a fat man's fall, where the champion of the evening was Officer McDonald of the 4th Police, who tipped the balance of the scales at 305 pounds. <laughs> Kind of astounding that this is the amount of importance they gave to this, this news. It's just one sentence long. Charles Williams Jr. Jr. was the owner of a prominent telegraph manufacturing business in Boston. He was born on March 2, 1830 in Middlesex Village, Massachusetts, which is currently part of Lowell and Chelmsford. He was the son of Charles Williams Sr., a hat maker and former member of the New Hampshire State Legislature and Rebecca Frost Williams, who was born in Somerville, then Charlestown, in 1809. Charles and Rebecca and their five children moved to Somerville in 1846, just four years after uh, Somerville was incorporated as a separate town. One account of what Somerville was like in its early years was given by John Eyre in a historical address for the 50th anniversary of the First Universalist Church in Somerville in 1904. And it said, Many of Somerville's inhabitants were engaged in agricultural or kindred pursuits, although there was a sprinkling of men, of men doing business in Boston. Union Square, with its half dozen houses, two stores, and yawning sand pit posed as the center of town. The Middlesex Canal was in operation. Tolls were being collected on the Medford Turnpike. Occasional trains were run, stopping at stations in town. Somerville was a territory of few streets, no sidewalks or street lamps, no drainage or water supply. A single hand engine was the only protection against fire, and to get a cent's worth of yeast, one had to go into East Cambridge or Charlestown. So it was very different than it is today. Union Square certainly wasn't holding celebrations to celebrate fluff at that time. Charles Williams Jr. himself was 16 years old when his family moved to Somerville. He had a talent for mechanics and electricity and magnetism. His first known job was with an electrician named Dan, um, Daniel Davis in Boston, whose firm manufactured telegraph and philosophical instruments. And philosophical instruments were instruments used for um, scientific research. 
A few years later, when he was still in his 20s, Williams formed a partnership with a Mr. Justin Hines, and they started their own manufacturing business in Boston, creatively called Williams and Hines. And um, uh, Charles Williams worked there for a while. And then in 1864, Justin Hines retired and Charles Williams took over as the sole owner of the business. He moved his business to a larger building in Boston at 109 Court Street and changed the name of the business to Charles Williams Jr., manufacturer of telegraphic instruments. Uh, 109 Court Street doesn't exist anymore. It uh, was located in Scully Square and it was part of the demolition when they um, put up uh, City Hall. There is a small uh, plaque on a little pedestal that, that is the, uh, it, it tells where the place is, but it doesn't exist anymore, unfortunately. Um, in the 1860s, Boston and New York were the two leading centers for the manufacture of telegraphic equipment and Williams had a staff of stilled electrical mechanics as well as specialized machinery for building telegraph equipment. And the quality of their work was very well respected around the world. Uh, Williams' camelback keys and sounders can be found in the collections of many telegraph um, historians and museums today. In addition to manufacturing telegraph equipment, Williams also leased out space in his workshop and the services of his workmen for inventors who wanted to have prototypes of their inventions made. Many of the inventors who used William's shop uh, were not uh, well known, their uh, ideas just failed, but a few of them did become prominent. Among them were um, Edward T. Holmes, who purchased a patent for a burglar alarm that would sound a bell if a door or window in a building were open. And his design of a central office to monitor burglar alarms around the city served as the prototype for the early days of the telephone when they started setting up switchboards. There was Moses Farmer, who participated in the creation of a fire alarm telegraph system for the city of Boston and was known for the development of the thermoelectric battery. There was also a young man named Thomas Edison, who at age 21 used Williams' workshop in his off hours from his regular job at Western Union to just play around with his ideas. And um, so here's a few ads, and um, yeah, these are all ads for Charles Williams' shop. This is one of his camelback keys over here for the telegraph. This is an uh, ad for Edison, and he was actually using Charles Williams as his, his business address for his inventions. By 1869, it was noted that William Shop employed 15 persons in the manufacture of telegraphic instruments, batteries, and bur burglar alarms. His shop shipped goods to all parts of the United States, the British provinces, South America, and the West Indies. As his shop expanded, Williams started hiring more and more workmen. In 1872, Williams hired a young 18-year-old shy man from Salem, <coughs> excuse me, named Thomas Watson. Watson described Williams as one of the best men I have ever known. Better luck couldn't befall a boy than to be brought so early in life under the influence of such a high-minded high gentleman as Charles Williams. Within two years, Watson was known as one of the shop's best workmen. The inventors who came into Court Street often requested to work directly with Thomas Watson because he had such a good reputation. Years later, Watson described these men who came in to have their inventions tried out in a rather amusing uh, write-up in his biography. He said, there was a constant stream of wild-eyed wild -eyed inventors with big ideas in their heads and little money in their pockets coming into the shop to have their ideas tried out in brass and iron. Most of them had an angel whom they had hypnotized into paying their bills. My enthusiasm and perhaps my sympathetic nature made me a favorite workman with these men of visions. Few of their ideas ever amounted to anything, but I liked to do the work because it kept me roaming in fresh pastures all the time. Apparently Watson worked on so many failed projects that he said, had it not been for my youthful enthusiasm, I, feel that, I fear that this experience would have made me so cynical as to the value of electrical inventions that my future prospects may have been injured. Fortunately, Watson kept his enthusiasm for these electrical follies by the time a professor in vocal physiology and elocution from Boston University walked into their office. Um, and he had come in to build a harmonic telegraph line. The professor was 27-year-old Alexander Graham Bell, and he was trying to win a $1 million prize that was being offered by Western Union at the time 
for someone to build a harmonic telegraph line. In the 1870s, city streets were just covered by a web of telegraph lines. Each individual telegraph line could only transmit one message at a time. Therefore, they needed a lot of lines. And especially in the winter, sometimes storms would come and it would just knock down all of the lines. It was a complete mess. As the need for more and more communication spread, they just kept adding more lines and, and Western Union decided they needed to do something to encourage people to um, try to develop a telegraph wire that could simultaneously transmit multiple messages at, at the same time. So this is what Alexander Graham Bell was coming into the shop trying to do. Charles Williams assigned Thomas Watson to work with Bell and together they worked in the garret of Williams um, shop at 109 Court Street working on the harmonic telegraph. So this is the actual garret of his um, workshop Years after the telephone was invented, Thomas Watson actually went through, dismantled the whole garret where the telephone was invented, numbered all the pieces so it could be reassembled. And for a time, um, this was in Post Office Square in Boston. And um, I believe it was an AT&T building that was there. So it was there for a little while. Then they decided they didn't want it anymore. And Verizon took over. And Verizon took the garret. And it actually, this is a picture of it today. Um, it exists in the Verizon building that's very close to 109 Court Street next to, to um, City Hall. Verizon has a lovely telephone museum there. Unfortunately, it's closed to the public. <laughs> but this is there. It's a, it's a beautiful museum. It's a gorgeous museum. Um, they have a lot of content there. Yeah, they use it for private functions. Um, <laughs> um, so this is where they worked on the telegraph uh, wire. So they worked for many months on this but the success in trying to come up with a wire that could transmit multiple messages kept eluding them. One evening as they were becoming quite discouraged with their work, Bell, perhaps to cheer Watson up, said to him, I have another idea that I haven't told you about that I think will surprise you. Again, this is from Watson's um, biography that I'm reading from. Watson recalled that he listened somewhat inattentively. He said, my receptive pow powers were hardly at their best for those evenings that I stayed in Boston to work meant an eight, 18 hour work day for me. But when Bell went on to say that he was sure that he would soon be able to talk by telegraph, his startling assertion banished my tired feelings and I don't remember that it ever came back. Bell explained to me, if I can get a mechanism which will make a current of electricity vary in its intensity as the air varies in density when a sound is passing through it. I can telegraph any sound, even the sound of speech. Bell and Watson threw themselves into this new idea and started researching it. The process was very time consuming and Bell was not a wealthy man. He often had problems coming up with enough money to pay Williams for the use of his workshop and the services of Watson. Charles Williams was very frustrated by this, but he agreed to accept late or partial payments to allow this work to continue. The complete story of Watson and Bell's race to the patent for the telephone would take a whole talk in itself. There's an excellent book by Seth Shulman entitled The Telephone Gambit that I would highly recommend to anyone who's interested in the whole controversy over the patent for the telephone. But for our purposes today, let's just say that Bell did obtain the patent for the telephone in 1876. At that point, Gardner Hubbard, who um, was a financial backer of Bell's and would soon become his father-in-law, which is another great story. It's included in the Seth Shulman book. Um, Gardner Hubbard offered Thomas Watson free room and board, a modest salary, and 10% interest in any of Bell's patents if Watson would agree to give up any of his non-telephone re related work in Williams' workshop. Watson hesitated. He had been earning a good wage with Williams. He was making $3 a day. He was very well respected at the shop and was working his way up to become one of the four men. And he enjoyed working for Charles Williams. He really respected him. Plus, over the years, Watson had seen so many inventors have their inventions fail, and he couldn't be sure that this wouldn't be another one. So he took quite a while to think it over before finally accepting Gardner Hubbard's offered, offer, and he gave up the rest of his work to focus on the telephone. Watson said, I accepted, although I wasn't altogether sure it was a wise thing to do from a financial standpoint. Around the same time, 
Charles Williams and his wife, Caroline Cole Williams, um, purchased a home of their own in Somerville. Charles and Caroline had been married back in 1864 when he was 33 and she was 18. She was the daughter of Erastus E. Cole and Harriet Narcissus Whitcomb, who lived on Perkins Street in East Somerville. Charles and Caroline first lived with his father and then with her family, and together they had three children, Herbert, who died of tuberculosis at the age of six, a second son, Lester, and one daughter, um, Mary Alice. In 1876, Charles and Caroline purchased their own house, an elegant home on one Arlington Street, in East Somerville for $7,400. Their house occupies two lots and it was just around the corner from Caroline's father's house. The Williams home was originally built by Nathan Tufts in 1858. And actually Nathan Tufts is um, a relative of the family as well. And this house is described as an excellent example of Italianate style. It's an L-shaped house composed of a generously proportioned main block and a fairly extensive West L. Shortly after Williams had purchased the house, he um, added some East Lake style elements, including the ornate front porch and the wrought iron railings over the window. Um, one of the things I love about going over to this house and trying to get a good picture of it is there's always telephone wires in the way, and I love that. <laughs> Even in this old picture, which is, um, oh, I'm forgetting when that's from, it might be from the 20s or 30s, there's still telephone wires in front of it. Um, six years after he purchased this house at 1 Arlington Street, Williams purchased the house next door at 13 Lincoln Street, which he rented to Caroline's brother, Lester Cole, and his family. And Williams also owned a stable on George Street around the corner. So this is Lincoln Street, Arlington Street. This is Charles Williams' house. He, it occupied these two lots. This is the house he bought next door for Lester Cole. This is Erastus E. Cole's house, so that's Caroline's father. Her brother John Cole is up there. Um, uh, Jason Delano is, I think, her brother-in-law, and Charles Williams had his stable down there. By the spring of 1877, the telephone had been refined and was now ready for a test outside of the workshop. They had already conducted tests of the telephone between different rooms in the workshop and between um, the workshop on Court Street and another workshop that was on Exeter Street in Boston. Um, uh, Bell had moved some of his operations at the very end when he was trying to get the patent to Exeter Street because he was afraid of somebody trying to steal his ideas. So he kind of hid away at the very end of his development there. So they had conducted those tests, but now they wanted to conduct a real test outside of the workshop. Years earlier, Williams had uh, strung a telegraph wire from his shop on Court Street, the three-mile stretch directly to his house um, on Arlington Street, to connect two printing telegraphs. So Charles Williams decided that he would try to use that same telegraph line and connect two phones to see if that would work. It wasn't successful. So now he decided to try um, a single telephone wire, a, a dedicated telephone wire, strung between Court Street and Somerville. All telephones are given a number, or they were given a number, in accordance to their order of manufacture. The phone that Charles Williams installed in his house was Bell Telephone number one. The one in his workshop was number two. The installation of that line was completed on April 4, 1877, and it proved successful, making Williams' home the first home in the world to have a private telephone line. In his diary, Charles Williams made a modest entry recording this event. He said, the first telephone line ever built was from my office, 109 Court Street, Boston, to my house, Arlington Street, East Somerville. It was finished April 4th, 1877. We talked over the line, Professor Bell present. Charles Williams had wonderful diaries and, and little journals that he kept, which was wonderful to have access to. Uh, this April 4th event uh, had a little bit of press coverage. This was the event that the brieflet that I showed you earlier mentioned. But other than that, it wasn't noticed that much. Some years later, Charles Williams was interviewed for a newspaper, and the reporter described the first telephone itself. This is not old number one, um, but this is what it looked like. The reporter said, it was a box of black walnut and looked like the cover of a sewing machine, but somewhat smaller. There was no receiver hanging on its back, no crank to turn, no bell to ring, nothing but this box that lay flat on a table. 
Charles Williams then went on to describe the events of April 1877 himself. He said, this is the first bell telephone ever made. Every telephone made bears its number, but this is old number one, which is what we called the book, was old number one. After Alexander Graham Bell made the phone, I strung a wire from my shop out to my house about three miles and took this telephone out there. The telephone lay on a shelf put up against a wall at such a height that I could speak into it as I sat on a chair facing it. We had another telephone in my shop and when he was ready to call the attention of someone at this end, he tapped on the diaphragm of the phone with a lead pencil, and that was the first way of signaling. So for quite a while, that was the way that you got someone's attention, and it only worked if a room was very quiet and you were quite close to the machine, and Thomas Watson soon realized that he would have to change that because he said it would increase the cost of the phones if we had to include a pencil with every phone sold. <laughs> I like Thomas Watson. <laughs> News of the telephone eventually spread and people began to come into William's shop to try out the invention for themselves. This is a drawing of, um, of William's shop. This is supposed to be William's. This is Edward T. Holmes, the inventor who uh, had developed the burglar alarm in his office. And in his autobiography, he talks a little bit about his relationship with Charles Williams. So people would come into William's shop to try out this invention for themselves. And William's wife, Caroline, as the only one who had a phone they could call, was the recipient of a lot of calls. I always like to think that Caroline was the first wife who ever like, would call up her husband and say, could you pick up some milk on the way home? <laughs> Less than a month after that first call, the new telephone company had developed a leasing plan, and customers began signing up. The first paying customer was Roswell C. Downer, a friend of the Williams family from church here in Somerville. On May 1st, 1877, Downer ventured two phones that were put on a private line between a State Street office and his home in Somerville, and soon more orders started to roll in. Charles Williams was able to position himself to take advantage of this growing business. He had an agreement that he would be the sole manufacturer of telephones, and he would also be able to lease out the phones for a commission, so he had two sources of income. The following two years were exciting, but also stressful and chaotic. At first, Thomas Watson personally constructed each telephone in William's shop. And Watson said, the first telephones could only transmit over a few miles and required a voice with the carrying capacity of a steam calliope. I made all of Bell's telephones for a long time. Over, almost every batch we turned out was an improvement over the preceding ones. That is, they were smaller and handier. We made a hand telephone of wood so that um, you could talk into it and then hold it up to your ear. And some people wanted to so that they could uh, do both at once. At first, the telephone business was very informal and it ran on a shoestring. There was often not enough money to purchase the materials needed to build the phones. Cash was very tight. There were months when no salaries were paid, bills were owed, and credit was non-existent. For much of his early work on the telephone, Williams, with considerable reluctance, took Bell stock, which was of very questionable value, as means of payment, when what he really needed was cash to pay off his creditors, who were hounding him all the time. Although there was interest in this new invention, many people that it was, thought that it was just a fad or a toy. It certainly was not a proper means of communication to be used for business. At first, people didn't know how to use the telephone, and they needed instructions and encouragement to get over their stage fright of talking into this odd machine. And this, I recently found this. This is a great little business card with a little drawing of, of people using the telephone early on. Um, there was also a question of what to say when answering a telephone. There was a debate over this. Bell had origi originally suggested the word ahoy, didn't catch on. <laughs> the standard greeting that we use today, hello, is actually because of Edison. The first uh, public switchboards in the country were equipped by Edison, and he provided a manual that went with the switchboards, and the manual generally said, say hello when you answer the telephone. The very first um, public switchboard in the world was in New Haven, Connecticut, and that first one had a manual which alternated between the casual hello and a very formal what is wanted. Um, hello went out 
And it's kind of interesting that both the telephone and the more casual hello greeting were a real social leveler at the time. It really cut through that 19th century etiquette that you do not speak to anyone until you've properly been introduced. It was, it was a whole different thing. In spite of the perception of the new invention, orders continued to roll into William's shop for more and more telephones. As the sole manufacturer, Williams was racing to keep up with demand. In July of 1877, he was manufacturing 25 phones a day. In August, he increased his production to 50 a day. A year later, Williams and the Bell Company signed a formal agreement. It was a three-page handwritten contract giving Williams the exclusive right to manufacture telephones for Bell. Williams was to be paid $1.60 for each hand telephone and $2.45 for each box telephone. The contract also named Thomas Watson as the superintendent for Bell Telephone, and it stated that Watson would inspect each telephone before it left the shop. On December uh, 27, 1879, the Somerville Journal colorfully described the installation of a Bell Telephone in their own offices. It said, we have had one of these communicators and receivers of promiscuous intelligence put into the Somerville Journal office. It is extremely ornamental and unexplainably useful. By its aid, we can now communicate with parties at eight different points at, later, at greater or less distance, and thus save many a weary tramp. In time, we will connect with hundreds. Our wires center on a switch table, a very ornamental specimen of wall furniture. Each wire has a separate circuit connected with a signal or enunciator, which drops when any of our numerous friends want to talk with, talk with us and it rings a bell. And then conversation of the most interesting and profitable nature succeeds until the subject and order is satisfactorily finished. Our instrument is what is known as a bell telephone. The ease with which conversation is carried on by telephone is marvelous, and there seems to be almost no limit to its possibilities. Charles Williams, Jr. of the city constructed our line and has done the work in a manner to merit general patronage. The pace of growth in the telephone business during this time was dizzying. Less than three years after that first phone call, Williams had 60 employees, new machinery, and the ability to produce 670 phones a week. By 1880, he was producing more than 1,000 with the support of four other factories, and it still was not enough to keep up with demand. Charles Williams' shop was overwhelmed. The Bell Company proposed to buy a controlling share of Western Electric, whose facilities were underutilized at the time, and merge Charles Williams' factory into a larger consolidated manufacturing company. Bell Telephone had grown from a loosely organized association into an emerging powerhouse called American Bell Telephone. Um, so here's a Charles Williams' business card when it was part of American Bell Telephone. And it was a two-sided card, that's the front and back. In 1882, Williams, who was then 52 years old, offered to sell his firm to American Bell and return for cash and stock in Western Electric, which took over as the permanent and exclusive uh, manufacturer of all telephones for American Bell at that time. Williams' shop, which had expanded to include both 109 and 115 Court Street, became a Western Electric factory, with Charles Williams staying on as its manager. So that's the, the card for that one. Two, uh, two years later, after the consolidation, Williams began to transfer his operations to the Western Electric shops in New York and Chicago. And that year, he changed his vocational listings in the Somerville directory from a manufacturing electrician to manager at the Western Electric Company. And soon after that, he closed his shop at 109 Court Street. In 1909, the Boston Herald wrote, when Bell Company stocks started to soar in valuation, Charles Williams was able to exchange his holdings and secure three shares for each one of his original shares. This, with the dividends, made him rich, but the real source of his wealth was the consolidation in 1884 of his factory on Court Street with three other large electrical manufacturing plants in the United States. This formed the Western Electric Telephone Company, which now has monster factories in New York and Chicago. So Charles Williams had stock in Western Electric. He had that Bell stock that he so reluctantly took uh, as payment earlier, which increased in value as well. And um, this was also a time before income tax, so Charles Williams was doing okay. <laughs> to some extent, Charles Williams was lucky. His choice to become a machinist put him in the right place at the right time to take advantage of a life-changing invention, but luck is never enough by itself. 
Williams had a combination of skills that fueled his success and was a meticulous record keeper that thankfully many people in the family had retained his records. He carefully tracked income and expenses. He was a manager able to attract and retain skilled workers. He kept abreast of world events and saw the potential of great ideas. And he was also willing to take risks. And those risks ended up paying off very well for him, which allowed him to settle into a very comfortable retirement. When Charles Williams retired, he and his wife Caroline spent many years traveling the world together with their children, Lester and Mary Alice. This is Mary Alice. They traveled to France, Ireland, England, Germany, Russia, Venezuela. These pictures were taken when they were in Berlin. Um, their last recorded tri trip was to Yosemite Valley in 1894, just four years after it had been declared a national park. Shortly after that trip, Charles's health began to decline, and he stayed close to home after that. Charles Williams Jr. died in Somerville on April 14, 1908, at the age of 78. The Committee on Necrology of the Somerville Historical Society wrote about Williams the following year. It said, Mr. Williams was of very quiet disposition, extremely fond of books and reading, and with an ambition for traveling the world over. He took great pleasure in his travels, having visited all places of interest in his own country in a number of foreign lands until about 10 years ago, when overtaken by disease, he rested in his beautiful home, happy in the society of his books, his deep affection for his wife, children, and all members of his family. Up through his last years, Charles Williams retained his keen interest in business and investing. Three years after Charles Williams died, his son, Lester, passed away due to complications from a routine surgery. Charles's wife, Caroline, went on to live another 32 years. In the 1920s, she moved from 1 Arlington Street in Somerville to the Somerset Hotel on Commonwealth Ave in Boston. She lived there with her sister, Alice, and they occupied one third of the top floor and had a full staff to care for them. Caroline had a Pierce Arrow motor car that her chauffeur would bring around front every day, whether she needed it or not. And both Caroline and Alice were remembered as very generous and loving people. When members of the family would come visit, Caroline would often hand out stock certificates to them, and Alice would hand out $5 solid gold pieces to them. Caroline maintained a friendly relationship with Thomas Watson over the years. He would often stop by to visit and have tea with her. He read Caroline his autobiography as he was writing it, especially the parts about Charles, Charles Williams, to be sure that they were accurate. Watson was a kind, engaging, funny character, and Caroline always loved his visits. Unlike her time with Thomas Edison, who she always described as kind of being crabby. <laughs> Caroline Williams passed away on March 27, 1940, at the age of 95. Mary Alice, um, so Mary Alice, uh, as the only surviving child, went on to marry Arthur Aldersley Kidder, also of Somerville. His family uh, lived very close to here on Aldersley and Kidder uh, Road or Street, whatever's around the corner here. Um, Mary Alice was always very proud of her father's connection to the telephone. And there's a lovely story about Mary Alice in the family that in the 1930s, there was a young salesman who came to her door one day to try to stir up some interest in this newfangled device called the telephone. And Mary Alice, who was very proper, listened to him very politely. And when he was done, she just said, come inside, young man, and I'm going to tell you all about the telephone. <laughs> <laughs> Mary Alice passed away in August of 1976. The history of the Williams family and Caroline's family, the Coles, along with the Tufts, the Vinyls, and Kidders, who also appear on their family tree, is deeply connected with the history of Somerville from its beginnings. This is the Cole family. Uh, this is Caroline in the center. We believe this was taken in their house on Perkins Street, and we think these are portraits of their parents. And I apologize for the quality of the picture, but it was the best that the family had. Historical records show that a handful of families were active in nearly every civic pursuit in Somerville in uh, the 19th century. The Coles, the Tufts, the Kidders, the Vinyls, and the Williams all knew each other from town government, from church, either the Unitarian or Universalist churches, and the many, many charitable associations and social clubs that were active in Somerville at the time. 
Not surprisingly, marriages arose from these close community ties. The first fire department in this area was called Engine Company No. 6 and was appointed by selectmen in 1838. Among the early engineers and firemen were Nathan Tufts, Nathan Tufts Jr., Robert uh, Vinyl, and Oliver Tufts. In 1846, a firefighting boys company was organized of young men between the ages of 16 and 20. Quincy Vinyl and Robert Vinyl were members of that group. In 1850, the fire department of Somerville was formally established and Nathan, Nathan Tufts Jr. was appointed the chief engineer. Robert Vinyl was the chief of the department. When the town of Somerville sub celebrated its 25th anniversary, serving on the various committees for the event were Caroline's father, Erastus E. Cole, Nathan Tufts, Oliver Tufts, Robert Vinyl, Charles Tufts, Nathan Tufts Jr., Quincy Vinyl, and Lester Cole. So it's like a whole family tree was planning this event. Clubs played a large role in Somerville community life in those days. In 1885, for example, there were 64 clubs listed in the town directory, including three Masonic lodges, six Odd Fellow clubs, six temperance unit, unions, a wide assortment of others, such as the Catholic Order of Foresters and the Somerville Cycle Club. Charles Williams was a member of the Webkowit Club. I believe I'm pronouncing that correctly. Is that it? Yeah. Um, it was organized at the call of Lester Cole, which was Caroline's brother, and their clubhouse was located on Mount Vernon Street. The object of the club was the promotion of social intercourse, encouragement of kindly feelings, and good fellowship among its members. Club members included many of the prominent citizens of East Somerville, including Caroline's brother-in-law, the ex-mayor Charles Pope, along with Charles Williams Jr. and John Cole. Charles Williams belonged to three Masonic lodges, Robert Vinyl served as the first vice president of the, the Somerville Firemen's Relief Association. The Somerville Literary Association had um, Caroline's sister, Alice Cole, as a member. Charles Williams Jr. and Quincy Vinyl served as trustees of the Somerville Hospital. Anna Cole, a sister-in-law of Caroline Williams, was actually on the medical staff, which was unusual those days for a woman. The impression one gets of Somerville at this time is of men and women going out many evenings a week or a month to just to socialize, to bowl, to play cards, to discuss, discuss literature and politics and carry out charitable activities and to reinforce their relationships. In addition to all these groups, there was church. Many of the Williams extended family were members of the Universalist or Unitarian Church. Charles Williams' father participated in the founding of the Universalist Church in Somerville. At a meeting in a small schoolhouse in 1854, the first band of Universalists in Somerville adopted a constitution which appointed Charles William Sr. as clerk. And um, Erastus E. Cole was also, also on this list. Um, at that same meeting, Charles Tufts, Charles Tufts, whose brother Nathan Tufts is a direct ancestor of the family, made a donation of land to build the church. Among the handful of men elected to govern the new church was Caroline's father, Erastus E. Cole. And for many years, Charles Sr. held the position of Sunday school superintendent in the church, which was a rather prestigious role. And when he gave it up, he passed it along to his son, Charles Williams Jr., who held the position for eight more years. Although Charles Tufts was not a member of the Universalist Church himself, he and his wife, Hannah, were very generous to the church and its interests. They were, of course, instrumental in donating the land to establish Tufts uh, College to fulfill the church's wish to open a universalist college in New England. Then in 1879, after her husband's death, Hannah Robinson Tufts bequeathed $5,000 to the universalist church so that they could install a clock and bell in the church tower. The Somerville Journal gave an enthusiastic description of the new clock and bell and said the bell is quite pleasant in tone, clear in its sound, and is evidently quite satisfactory to all concerned. It seems that few areas of Somerville's early history were not touched in some manner by this whole extended family. In summary, after researching the full story of Charles Williams Jr., it's surprising to me that his name has not been better known. His role in supporting, manufacturing, and promoting the telephone in its early years was instrumental to its success. The publication, The Electrical Engineer, paid tribute to Charles Williams, Jr., calling him unquestionably one of the pioneers of the telephone. Without him, it is doubtful that Professor Alexander Graham Bell would have perfected his telephone. 
Without him, it is almost certain that the American Bell Telephone Company, which is now so rich and powerful, would have failed or at least been obliged to struggle on much longer against adverse opinion and financial difficulties. So I'm grateful to the Somerville Historical Society for giving me this opportunity to share the story of Charles Williams Jr. today and to spread the word of what he has done for both Somerville and for the world. So thank you. <laughs> Yeah, it was very interesting. I loved researching this book because I would spend a lot of time up at the Somerville Library on Highland Avenue and I would be in there for several hours just pouring through old records and documents. And then I would drive out and I would be on, you know, Kidder and Aldersley Street and then I would drive down past the Powder House and, you know, Tufts College and then go over to East Somerville by the house and it was such a wonderful way to bring history to life. It was, it was really lovely. Mm -hmm. Well, that was, be that was before um, Somerville was actually incorporated as a town, so I'm assuming that was probably from Charlestown, yeah. but it was for this area. And that's why the square got changed from Sandy Pit Square to Liberty Pole Square. It was named after the the engine that, um, that they had purchased. They had raised, the fire department had actually raised a platform and it became known as the New Falls Square. Hmm. And then after the Civil War, it became uh, New England Square. Oh, okay. So the first, so this was the New England Square. Hmm. <laughs> Any other questions? So did the family reach out to you to start this project? Mm -hmm. And then you said you did a lot of your research at Somerville, um, at the Somerville Library. Mm -hmm. What were your other sources? The family was a huge source of information, but um, they really didn't know the whole story. They knew that their great-grandfather had something to do with the early days of telephone. That, had been, that story had been handed down. Um, when the family... Uh, when different people in the family passed away, Charles Williams' possessions kind of got scattered. It's a very large family, and so things got scattered out, and someone had his journal, and someone had his business cards, and someone had his walking stick, and you know, all these different things. But nobody had the whole story. So um, Stephanie Nichols and I went around, and we interviewed at least 20 people in the family all over the country, and um, kind of pulled all these pieces together and then did additional research. Um, I did a lot of research online, um, looking through old publications, um, a lot of things like the, um, the electrical engineer, like weird little publications like that, had information about Charles Williams and um, Thomas Watson, Alexander Graham Bell, and so we were able to put more things together that way. Uh, we also reached out to people who were interested in the history of telephones, and there are some people who are really into the early history of telephones, and so we pulled a little bit more information that way. Uh, local newspapers were a great source, going back in the archives. The Somerville Journal is just wonderful. It, it was a good read back then. Um, <laughs> um, so all of those different sources, we just pulled together anything that we could, um, because it was kind of remarkable how little was really still in existence about Charles Williams. So any little bits that we could get, we pulled together and came up with the, his whole story. Yeah. You're welcome. So you know the house has been up for sale several times recently. Oh, did it? that sale go th I fall through? I, I thought it was being turned into a bed and breakfast. For, for the bed and breakfast? Because I know someone was trying to turn it into a telephone museum, which would have been so perfect. Um, <laughs> but he couldn't raise enough money. Um, but he, it was someone who really was very interested in this and, and had a long history with telephone. Um, yeah, and just, there would be enough support out there. Yeah, so yeah. And apparently it's a beautiful house. We tried to get a tour of it when it was on sale. I actually tried to bring members of the family, and it just didn't work time-wise and I think actually the time we finally um, 
had scheduled something, there was a horrible snowstorm. And, and yes, yeah, yeah, which was too bad because I would love to see inside of that house. Yeah, people have searched. So nobody knows where old number one is which drives everybody crazy. Nobody knows where old number one ended up. People have searched the house. A few, it's funny, not only did the family kind of search the house, but um, telephone collectors. There, there was this one telephone collector, I believe he lives in Worcester. He was instrumental in the Verizon Telephone Museum, the private museum. Um, and he, what is the story? I think he said when he was younger, his mother's seamstress or something actually worked out of Charles Williams' house. Um, in that L because it was divided up at that time or something so when he was a little kid he actually used to go to this house and he had memories of it and one time years ago when it went up for sale he went in and he said you know while he's looking around the house he's kind of like looking everywhere and um, <laughs> no sign of the phone um, so we're not exactly sure what happened to it maybe it got repurposed into something else in the workshop I, I yeah yeah, really. Yeah, it's it's kind of amazing that it hasn't been preserved. But it was such a tiny little thing. I, it, it, yeah, yeah. But hopefully, uh, hopefully the house will get turned into something good. Uh, the B and B would be okay. <laughs> Maybe the family could go stay there. <laughs> yeah. Oh. All right. Well, thank you. It's not. It's, it's, it is. So most of the books that I do are just for private publication for families. Occasionally they go out to historical societies or local libraries, but most of them are just for the family. Um, um, yeah, I can, if you're interested in that, let me know and I can talk to them. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And I wish that the Verizon Museum were open because it is such a wonderful facility. We, when we had the um, the book release party for the family, uh, about sixty people came from all over the world for it, and we got permission to hold it in the um, the Verizon Museum. And we hired some of the Freedom uh, Freedom Trail performers, and one of them took on the role of Thomas Watson and did such an amazing job. He already, I guess he had done Thomas Watson as a role in the past, but he asked for a copy of the book to review beforehand and he started like putting forth things about the family and, and how lovely it is to have tea with Caroline and, and he, was, he was so wonderful. The family was, was very impressed with him. Um. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs>